What's up, Badger fans? It's almost here. It's almost early signing day. Let's do a quick kind of preview. Let's talk about uh, how does Luke Fickle win signing day and who are your, your prospects you're most excited about in this class? Let's talk about it on today's Locked On Badgers. Let's go. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, Badger fans? Thank you for making Locked On Badgers your first listen every day, one of your first listens every day. Really do appreciate it. I apologize that this uh, episode's a little late. I'm just getting back from losing power. We had that wind and rainstorm come up through New England, so it's thrown me all for a loop, but we are here. Signing days tomorrow. I'm excited. Let's talk about it. Today's episode brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Lockdown College for $20 off your first purchase. I want to start with how does Luke Fickle win signing day? Like, what does winning signing day look like for the Badgers for this first Luke Fickle cycle? And then I'm going to talk about some of the players we're most excited about in this class. Going to be a ton of content after signing day as well, but I want to start looking at those players. If you're in the comments, uh, if you're watching live, let me know who your six, five, four, whatever it is. Who are you most excited about in this class? We're going to talk about that on this show. If you're in the comments, leave that comment. You know we'll loop back to it. But let's start here. <clears throat> How does he win signing day? How do we win signing day this year? Well, the first one is you keep everybody, right? Luke Fickle and this staff has done a tremendous job of that already. There has been multiple players in this class, and I can tell you this for a fact. And this shouldn't be a surprise. Like, this happens every year to every program, to prospects everywhere. Teams haven't stopped recruiting these kids, like the running backs, Mabry, uh, um, a couple, you know, one of the linebackers, um, the cornerbacks, like teams have continued to come after the guys that we have verbally committed in this class. And so far, Luke Fickle has really held it together. It's It's been impressive. Luke Fickle and this recruiting staff, right? Obviously, Pat, Max, Casey, um, <clears throat> everybody involved there has really held this class together. Can they get it through the finish line, right? Can they get to the end? And it really comes down to Xavier Lucas. Is Xavier now, don't get me wrong, like anything can happen in recruiting. If somebody flipped tomorrow that there's no smoke for, you never get shocked in recruiting, right? But for the most part, I think everybody's pretty solid. Xavier Lucas is the one that's been talked about a lot. Are they going to be able to keep him? Miami's made a huge push for him. He's he's a big part of this class. He's not a if you lose him, you know, no big deal. Like I think he's the the biggest, most physical, most important cornerback in this class. And I love Emilio Agard. I love Harper. He's – Lucas is a little different, right? He's six one. He's just bigger. He runs really well. He plays incredible competition. Here's what I'm hearing with him. Uh, I talked to somebody recently who who does talk to, to Xavier or is in contact with him and said he thinks it's Wisconsin. He thinks Wisconsin is going to stay on top in that commitment and that recruitment. Will it happen? Again, he didn't say it is Wisconsin. He said he thinks Wisconsin. I know, uh, I think on three, uh, flipped their crystal ball over to Miami. Some of that, listen, I wouldn't necessarily, don't ignore that, but also understand anytime a Florida Florida cornerback recruitment, uh, it's, it's Miami, it's FSU against Wisconsin. Typically, the industry is just going to automatically say, yeah, I think he's going to go to Miami. I think he's going to go to Florida State. There may not be smoke there. They're just playing the odds. The odds are a Florida cornerback, Florida high school cornerback, is going to go to one of those big three Florida schools if they offer them, if if the competition is Wisconsin, <clears throat> right? Historically, that's true. It's it's a really big battle, and it would be incredibly impressive if Wisconsin is able to fend off a Miami for a, a Florida high school cornerback. Now, the good part of this is that's who, that's who you want to be battling for cornerbacks. You want to battle – kids who have offers from Florida state and who have offers from Miami, Florida, like that's a really big commitment in their backyard. If you're able to go in there and fend those schools off and keep him, they were able to get him back on campus a second time. That's a really big deal, right? A huge deal. So understand that that is one of those bellwether type recruitments where can this staff hold on to a kid like that? Cause those are the type of players you need. You have to identify them early, which they did, right? They were in on him before some of these other schools really turned up the heat. And then you got to be able to hold on, right? It's it's kind of like the Greg Guard thing. Greg Guard has always historically been really good at identifying. He doesn't always close the deal and hold the deal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can this staff do that with Xavier Lucas? If you do, that's a big part of winning signing day. The other one is, can you close on Ernest Willard Jr., right? If you hold this class together, which is mostly going to be, can you keep Xavier Lucas? I know 
Darian Dupree's got some smoke too. I I don't think he's going anywhere. From what I've heard, the little bits I've, of people I've talked to, I, I think the bigger concern is Lucas. I think Dupree signs. And then it comes down to, can you get Ernest Willer Jr.? And I think all the signs kind of point to that. So if you're able to hold on to this class and then you get in that four-star, really unique type of athlete on the defensive line, you want signing day. For your, for your first class, look at this class. It's going to be borderline top 20 in the country, right? Maybe even a tick a higher if you if you can also land like a Rob Booker. Now, it depends It depends on what happens above you and around you, right? There, there's going to be more movement around you. Players are going to flip. Others are going to decommit. There's still players that are, are being waited on. Like, so we're not going to know right away. <clears throat> but we will be in that top 20-ish range, which it, for the first class for Luke Fickle, that's a win. Like that's winning again. That's winning signing day. Coming off a seven and five season, what have you sold? You you didn't sell winning on the field. You sold who you are. You sold the program, and finishing around the top twenty. If you can close out with Will, or if you can keep this class together, I think even if you if you were to lose Dupree, which I don't think will happen, but if you were to lose Dupree and you kept Lucas and landed Willer, like that's a win. You would not again. I'm not one of those guys who's like, oh, I don't really care about. No, Dupree's a really good. Like, you really want him in this class. He's unique. He's explosive. He's athletic. But if if we were just saying if you lost Dupree on signing day but added Willer, who here isn't making that trade, right? You still have Dylan Jones and Gideon Atuka in this class. That that defense alignment is so much more important than any one of the individual running backs. Like, it's not even a Dupree thing. It's a positional scarcity. So, yeah, you bring him in. You keep Lucas. And even if you were to lose Dupree, to me, that is winning this, this signing day, this class. Uh, Lord Croy says, <clears throat> uh, congratulations on your anniversary, Ryan. May you and your wife have many more years together. Thank you, man. Yeah, we I, I mentioned the other day we had um, 17 years invested into this now, and it's great. Like, she's awesome. She is definitely my better half. So thank you for that. All right, let's 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 take a quick pause here take, for our friends of the show. And we're going to come back. We're going to talk about the, the six players I'm most excited about in this class. I asked you in the chat, who are the players you are most excited about in this chat You can or in, in this class? You can list six, five, one, ten, whatever it is. We're going to talk about who we're most excited about because that's what recruiting is, right? Re- recruiting is excitement. It is the pipeline. It is the the never ending influx of talent. That's that's what makes college football so fun. That's one of the things that's always made college football so fun. Is every year you refresh talent and you dream on these players and you watch the film and you get excited. So you can tell I'm excited. I love recruiting, man. So let's talk about the six players I'm most excited about. I want to get your lists as well. Who are you most excited about in this class? Let's talk about it. But first, a quick break for. I think I'm back. I don't know, man. Let me know in the comments so you can hear me. Like our our internet just keeps going up and down. Um, so frustrating, but not as frustrating as it would be to lose um, Xavier Lucas. I don't know. All right, let me know if you guys can hear me. Let me know. Um, If not, I'll have to start. Okay, Mark says we're back. So let's just finish up this segment. Back, my friend. Back. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. Our internet was up, and it's back down. But I do want to finish this segment. I do want to talk about the players we're most excited about in this class. Potentially some sleepers as well, and some guys who I think are potentially going to play early. Um, I want to get your guys in here, though. Players you're most excited about. This is from Donnie House, Donnie Hayes, Dupree, Jones, Steck, Agard, Mabry. That's a great list. A couple of those are on my list. Mabry's on my list. Uh, Jones is on my list. Those are really good ones to be excited about. Uh, let's talk about uh, Jan. Jan uh, John Case says the running backs are huge. Mabry will be great. So let's just let me throw my list out there because some of these are just echoing my list. I have the players I'm most excited about: Mabry Metoyer, Anelu Lafayette, Thomas Heiberger, Dylan Jones, Xavier Lucas, and Darren Dupree. There's like ten more dudes. That I could be like, yeah, I really like Steck. I love Kevin Haywood. I'm big on um, Emilio Agard, right? Uh, I love Dylan Johnson. Like, there's a lot of guys in this class to get excited about. But I agree with John. The running backs in this class are, are top notch. There's three. People keep talking about there's two dudes. There's three dudes in this class. I'm telling you right now, I talk, talk to people in the, on the recruiting side. I've talked to people connected. Getting a Tuka is a real guy. Like he, he, they accepted his commitment early for a reason. They accepted his commitment as the second running back for a reason. They really think he can be an integral part of this offense. He can play early bowling ball with wheels is what I've heard. So I'm very excited about that one. Um, Ben Alden says Jones, Dupree, Anelu, Mandel, and Johnson. Mandel's a great one, right? If you watch Emerson Mandel, the film, he, he just pile drives people. Now there's some refinement there. They don't pass as much, but 
coming off the ball, leverage, explosion, athletic ability, carries the weight incredibly well. Um, I've had a little back and forth with his coach, very coachable kid from what I've heard, really good fit for the program. That's a great addition, Ben. Let's see, uh, a couple more in here that people are excited about. This is Guy Dupree, Johnson, Willer, Haywood, and Agard. Hey, you're seeing a lot of deep Dupree. You're seeing a lot of Agard. I love that you added Willer in here, Guy. Yeah, here's the thing. If Willer commits and – a lot of signs are pointing to that will happen. Willer jumps to maybe number two on my list, right? Let me tell you, I may remember Metoyer number one because he's the quarterback, because he's 6'5", because he has all the tools, because he has an NFL arm, because he's he can run. Like, he's number one for me. He's a unique quarterback prospect coming into Madison. Willer would be number two. Uh, number three, I have Lafayette. Lafayette is interesting because I think he's a guy he committed early in the process, uh, I think he's kind of gotten forgotten about a little bit. This is an elite edge pass rusher type, incredible in space, uh, pretty versatile like this. He, I think he could play next year because there's a need on this team. Now, you get the two outside guys in the portal this year with Lowry and Bias. Maybe maybe that lessens the need for Lafayette to play right away, but I think he could. He's not her big. Nobody's her big, but he's that type of guy. He's wired that type of way. He's he's really high for me, uh, Dylan Jones, because I think he's he is. Uh, Brian Smith has talked about it. He could play anywhere. He could play at Bama. He is incredibly natural, instinctual. I like him a lot. Xavier Lucas, for all the reasons I've talked about, and Darian Dupree because he's an X factor type weapon. He's the type of guy you can throw. Occasionally, you need somebody that can win one on ones against Ohio State, that can win one on ones against Michigan, that can win one on ones against Penn State, and coming in USC, Oregon. Dupree's that type of athlete. Like, you can throw the ball out in space. Ohio State can have their best guy out there, and Dupree can make a miss. That, that's the upside. we got to see it. Like, these are all upside projections. That's all recruiting is. But he can be that type of weapon that gives Wisconsin the edge in the one-on-ones, in the perimeter, in the open space that they haven't been able to get against the elite defenses and the elite athletes. That's why I love Dupree. I think he could bring that potentially to the offense. Christian Vasquez says, Vasquez says we need defense line help badly. Yep, agreed. Um, Colin Most says, what's happening with Rob Booker? I think everything that we've, we've heard so far is what's happening, right? It's, it's basically, uh, Wisconsin's still been after him. I I've heard from a couple people that they expect him to potentially flip. Uh, I, it wouldn't shock me. In fact, I'd be more surprised at this point if he doesn't sign with Wisconsin, but I don't know that in, in concrete. Now I know there are people, there are fans who, maybe aren't entirely thrilled with welcoming welcoming back a tight end that you know didn't sign here uh, that signed here decommitted went somewhere else i'm telling you you need all the athletes you can get on this team booker is a 6'6 in space kind of basketballish high point athlete at tight end if you can get him you get him and you trust luke fickle to to believe that he understands the culture and he understands the kid and he understands the locker room so i don't know for sure i would expect him if I had to make put money on it, which I'm not because it's recruiting and recruiting's crazy. I would put money on Booker signing with Wisconsin, just based on some things I've heard. But I, it's not set in stone. I would definitely take him though. Kyle Matson says thoughts on if we can get Tackett Curtis from the portal in USC. Yeah, I saw this. Um, this is this is interesting. Let me take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll talk about Tackett Curtis. All right, welcome back to Lockdown Badgers. Let, let's talk about Tackett Curtis, the inside linebacker coming out of USC. If you remember a year ago, Tackett was not just Bobby April's number one target, not just Jim Leonard's number one target. He might have been like the Wisconsin staff's number one target in that cycle from Paul Christ on down. He was an enormous, enormous target for Wisconsin in, in that class. Uh, really talented player, played at a powerhouse high school, um, incredible film like really instinctual great hitter went to usc i think he got a pretty big nil package there um but wisconsin was in his top two and from what i heard wisconsin if they had let him play the position he wanted to play would have signed him i, I heard that from a pretty direct source wisconsin wasn't as flexible as, i heard it wasn't an nil thing now does nil play a part obviously of course it does does the glitz of usc play a part obviously of course it does but that's Everything I heard about the kid was that's not who he was. He loved Madison, and they didn't give him the opportunity to play the position he wanted to play. They, they basically said you can be kind of an outside guy, and he wanted to play inside, and that was it. I was told if Wisconsin had given him that positional versatility, he would have committed to Wisconsin. I was told that directly from somebody very close to the, the recruitment. So I think he 
who had welcomed the chance to come back to Madison. He loved Madison. I mean, absolutely loved Madison. He really loved Jim Leonard and Bobby April as well, who obviously aren't here. But, yeah, he loved the city. He loved the idea of playing for Wisconsin. And USC, I think, just kind of came in with a bigger package, and they kind of gave him the ability to, you pick where you want to play, and they sold that. So if you could go back and get that guy, oh, my gosh. Yes, go get him. Because USC was bad defensively last year. He was a true freshman. So did he play up to expectations as one of the the blue chip linebackers in that class? No, that's not on him, right? Like if you could get him in, yes, like you go get that because he's he's a year removed away from being one of the, the top talents in the country. And I would bet that he would do better here. I, I would bet that he would flourish here a little bit more. Yeah, so you absolutely go and get him because the upside of him is still there, right? It, it's It's – all the tools that made him one of the most coveted prospects in the country with offers from Ohio State to USC to Wisconsin to LSU. LSU was desperate to get him. All, all of those talents and physical projections are still there. So, yeah, go get that, dude. I would be all about that. Ben Alvin says uh, we need inside linebacker play. Yep, agreed. All right. Um, here's, here's a couple things, too. I want to talk really quickly about some of my sleepers in this class, players who I don't think get enough love. And one of them might be a little surprising to you, but uh, let's start here. Ryan Corey, the inside offensive lineman, I think he's he, he's his film is good. And I think what we've done in the recruiting industry, and I shouldn't say we because I don't do this, but what recruiting industry pundits have done is kind of like the NFL draft model, you know, where the inside offensive lineman, you almost got to be like Larry Allen to get the four star, the five star. Ryan Corey gets knocked because he's not a tackle. If he was 6'6", with longer arms and maybe tackle projectable, I think he would be a four-star guy. The film's great. Everybody I talk to loves him. Recruiting analysts love him. They're just like, but he's a guard. Well, you need two guards. And Wisconsin's interior offense line play hasn't been that strong in the last couple of years. I love the fact that they're getting a couple of guys who are more projectable to play on the inside. I love Corey's film. I think he's incredibly underrated in this class. One of my favorite recruits in this class. Getting a Tuka is another. We talked about it. He gets completely overshadowed by Dupree and Jones, which is understandable, but he's he's a dude. Getting a Tuca can play, and the staff loves him. There's a reason they took him when they did. Maybe Metoyer. Like, I, this is an interesting one because certainly the quarterback gets a ton of hype. Everybody knows Metoyer's name, but he's he's a three-star on the 247 composite. He's an 87. I think that's absurd. I think from a recruiting standpoint, that's absurd. He's a 6'6 quarterback in Texas 6'8 football. Who, who can run the ball and has an NFL arm. Just from the projectability standpoint, he's a four-star guy. Uh, I don't understand the three-star ranking at all. I've talked to some industry guys. Rivals has him as a four-star. I don't get that at all. Those physical tools, that's, again, I use baseball analogies a lot. That's like a 6'6 high school pitcher who throws 97. Those guys are always first-round picks because the projectability is so unique that if he hits, he's an NFL guy. So to me, he's underranked, especially with 247 the composite. I don't understand that. On three, I think he's a little low on him, too. But Rivals got it right. And the other one I want to give you, I think Dylan Johnson, the defensive lineman, is underranked. Now, here's a guy. Now, he, he got a late bump up to the four-star. But what happens with recruits is if they start as a four-star, people remain more excited about him. Dylan Johnson started as a three-star guy, you know, battled between us and Northwestern, lost him to Northwestern. And because of that, the recruiting hype and the, the hype around the fan base around him has never been as high as I think it should be. Again, he got that late bump up to the four-star. But here's a 280, 290-pound guy who moves really, really well. Wrestler, you know, that that defensive line, like defensive line leverage and playing with tenacity and competitiveness. Wrestling is is hand in hand with that. I love the pickup. I think he's an incredibly safe prospect. He's gonna play early. And he's one of those guys who might be able to step in even next year. Maybe you remember Keanu Benton could step in right away. And part of that was that wrestling background. Now, he doesn't have the same type of size and frame as Benton, but he could be that type of player who can come in, contribute right away because he's already at that size. He has burst. And with the wrestling background, he understands leverage and competitiveness. So I'm a big fan of, of Dylan Johnson as well. I think he's underrated. Donnie Hayes says Landon Gothier for sleeper. Yeah, Northeast Wisconsin represent. He's a tackling machine, man. He, he's a good one too. Um, more athletic than you say is about a lot of Wisconsin kids, specifically a lot of Wisconsin linebackers. He is definitely more athletic than given credit for. So that's a good one too, Donnie. All right, we're going to wrap it up here. I, I got to restart my, my Wi-Fi to keep it going. But this is just a quick primer for signing day. We got interviews with a couple guys coming up today. Hopefully uh, both Heidelberger and Dylan Johnson will jump on the show today. Maybe even Grant Steck. 
Um, and then we have a bunch of content coming out over the next two days for recruiting content, class uh, reviews, positional grades, interviews with recruiting analysts. So I'm excited. I cannot wait for it to get here. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in for this kind of impromptu show. Again, I apologize for the internet issues, but I think we're mostly back up and going. Anyway, on Wisconsin, signing day is almost here. We'll talk later.